Hey friend, Mike McCurry here for the final installment of this week of Bible Tract Echoes. I'm so thankful for the opportunity that I have to be speaking to you right now. I'm going to encourage you to join us though. I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me encourage you to join us next week for the next installment of this broadcast because what we talk about today will be continued in next week's broadcasts. I'm so excited about the opportunity to share with you continuing this theme of ingredients of a good Christian ingredients of a good Christian. I hope you want to be a good Christian. I know I do, and I know I fail so miserably. Maybe, just maybe, what we talk about from the Bible today will be of help to you. Let me tell you about a special product that we produce at Bible Tracks Incorporated. Before we jump into the scriptures today, by by way of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, let's look at the book of Genesis. You turn there while I tell you about this special product. You see, I'm holding in my hands right now a little pamphlet titled, What is a Tract? What is a Tract? You see, this little pamphlet right here explains by the very hand of Paul Levine. He wrote this gospel tract some years ago. This little pamphlet, it's not a gospel tract technically, it tells you what a gospel tract is. It tells you how to use a gospel tract, gives you some tips and tricks. Let me encourage you to place an order at BibleTracksInc.org. You don't have to order this one because we actually include this little pamphlet with every order that we ship out. We've got almost uh, right about 50 different titles of gospel tracts. I'm so thankful for the Lord allowing us to print all of them, but What good are they if we don't use them or don't know how to use them? And that's where What is a Tract comes in handy. Go to our website, BibleTractsInc.org today. Now, let's jump into the Bible. We talked for the last four days, can you imagine that, about the first ingredient of a good Christian. We talked about the amen, A-M-E-N, amen. See, that word is not just a vocalization. It's not just an audible little word. It's a spirit, a spirit of agreement. And that's really where the mindset is of what we were looking for. We talked about the method and the meaning and all of those things, the mandate of the word amen. But in reality, what we were going after is to explain the magnitude and the mindset of the spirit of agreement that we need to have, that you and I need to have with the Bible. You don't need to agree with me, and I don't need to agree with you, except for when it comes to matters of God's Word. Let's continue on today and look at the second ingredient. We're in the book of Genesis, chapter number 8 and verse number 20. Find your place there. Genesis eight twenty. the Bible says, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. We're talking about ingredients of a good Christian. Oh, friend, I, I want my life to be a sweet, a sweet savor to God Almighty. Wouldn't it be amazing if your life and mine was a pleasing scent, was almost like perfume to God? That that, that would be absolutely amazing. But how can you and I have the ingredients that would cause that to be the case? Well, we talked about the amen, a spirit of agreement. Today, we're going to talk about the altar or a willingness to make adjustments. You know, almost every great decision I've ever made was made at an altar. I think of the, my salvation, the day that I accepted Christ at a small church in Monterey Bay, California. I got saved and I went to the altar. The moment that I surrendered to God 
for him to do anything he wanted with my life and ended up, uh, ended up being full-time ministry. That's how I came to be talking to you right now. I have the privilege of serving God as a full-time evangelist. And right now I'm actually at a camp in the Butler, Pennsylvania area, preaching to teenagers and leading singing and, and has, spending time with some juniors, just having a grand time, all because there was a moment at an altar that I surrendered to God my call to preach. Of course, uh, another item that I get to utilize this week. Well, where did that come from? Well, it happened at an altar with tears coming down my face. I knelt down. My pastor put his arm around me and I saw a puddle begin to grow where my pastor was crying and praying for me as I surrendered to the call to preach. How about getting married? You want to talk about a wise decision. Marrying Rebecca was an absolutely, of all the decisions I made in my life, of course, surrendering to God and accepting him as my Savior. Okay, we'll put those up there in the pantheon. But marrying my wife, that has to be way up there. And whether you care or not, this thought, this theme, it was placed on my heart at an altar. What is an altar? Well, let's begin with this. An altar is a place to start. And again, I want to be very careful and point out to you, my friend, that we're not just talking about the physical place of the altar. We're going to talk about this more in just a moment, but we're talking about a spirit of adjustment, a willingness for God to move into any part of our heart that there are no locked doors as the Spirit of God moves across our life. There's nothing that he can't access, and not just that, but he has the keys to the levers to adjust anything he wants to. We're going to use the word altar, but every time I say that, I want you to think of the word adjustment. The altar is a place to start. You know, it's a sad thing, but you shouldn't need to be told that altars are important. You know the Bible tells us they are. Look back at Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Noah built that altar. Noah built that altar and sacrificed without being told to. Did he build a house first? No. He built an altar. Did he plant fields first? No. He built an altar. Did he dig a well first? No, friend, he built an altar. Did he put up fencing for the animals? No, he built an altar. Did he begrudge God this thing? Did he do it with a lackluster attitude? Or do, did he do it out of praise and thanksgiving? The first thing he did was he built an altar. Of the incredibly limited, think about this, there were a very finite amount of animals left on the earth. And what did he do? He took one of every one that God wanted and sacrificed them. They didn't have refrigerators back then. He wasn't going to be able to store all that meat. And regardless, it wasn't his meat anyway. He was giving it to God on an altar. The altar is a place to start. What happened? Well, it pleased God. Here are some particulars about an altar. And before you get too concerned... Yes, friend, for these next few moments, I am referencing the altar at your local church. I'm referencing as well, though, the altar of your heart. Of course, as I already mentioned, and please understand, I, I, sometimes I feel like I'm being too brash, too blunt. I'm talking about the spirit of adjustment, the spirit that's willing to make adjustments as God sees fit. But, Go ahead and apply, please. Everything I tell you right now, apply it to the altar of your heart. Apply it to the altar at your local church. The altar, it's a place to start. It pleases God, but the altar requires sacrifice. You've got to bring something to the altar. Even the poor people among Israel, though they were given a lighter cost in animals, they didn't have to bring uh, the most expensive animals if they were under a certain wage bracket, if you will. They still had to bring something. 
Leviticus chapter 5, verse 7. And if he be not able to bring a lamb, he's saying if you don't have a lamb, if you can't do that, then he shall bring for his trespass, for his sin, which he hath committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. The sacrifice for you, though, I'm guessing you're not going to be bringing a lamb to church or two turtle doves or pigeons. Your sacrifice, it might be repentance. Psalm 51, of course, a psalm written by David in the aftermath of an egregious error. Psalm 51, 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, David says here, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. We try to offer lip service, don't we? We end up with unresolved sin in our lives. We try to just give up token items, small things. And if we just maybe admit wrongdoing, maybe that'll be enough. If we say, I'm sorry, friend, if you aren't broken, God might just break you. Regardless, the altar or the spirit of adjustment, it's going to cost you something. The altar doesn't just require sacrifice, though. We're going to talk as we begin next week, as we continue in this vein, talking about the second ingredient of a good Christian. The altar, yes, it's a place to start. Yes, the altar requires sacrifice, but the altar, it's a sanctified and a special place. Over this weekend, would you ponder, would you meditate on, would you consider the fact that Maybe it's been a little while since you've visited the altar. I'm not just talking about the physical place in your church. I'm talking about the altar of your heart. Let me encourage you, before we meet again here on the Bible Tract Echoes radio broadcast, would you spend a few moments on the altar of your heart asking God what he'd like you to sacrifice? I want to tell you how much I appreciate your listenership today. If you're not already subscribed to our podcast, you can search for Bible Tract Echoes on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, whatever your favorite podcast player is. Subscribe to that if you would. Then also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Bible Tract Echoes. We greatly appreciate that. Follow us on Facebook and all of those things. We'll post updates in the near future. I want to thank you for being a part of our broadcast virtually today by way of the radio waves. But I'm going to ask you to come join us in person on October 1st at our grand opening at our brand new building in Odell, Illinois. The announcer will be on in just a moment, giving you all kinds of ways you can contact us. I'd love to hear from you if you have questions. Have a great day for his glory. We'll talk to you next week. God bless.